Okay, good morning. Buenos días uh, a todos y a todas. Uh, bienvenidos al webinar de Salurbal. Welcome to our uh, first Salurbal uh, webinar, uh, where we will be sharing with you some findings from Salurbal on uh, inequalities in mortality outcomes in Latin American cities. Um, this is the beginning of a series of webinars that we will be doing. Um, although the webinar will be in English, um, feel free to speak Spanish or Portuguese um, when you ask questions and we will be happy to translate um, or respond in, in, in Spanish as well. Um, I am Ana diaz Ru, and I'm the principal investigator of Salurval uh, here at the Dornstife School of Public Health at uh, Drexel University in Philadelphia at the Urban Health Collaborative. Um, just before uh, we introduce our speakers, I just wanted to share with you a few things about the Salurval project. Um, the, the project is uh, coordinated by the, um, uh, by the Dornstaff School of Public Health, but involves a very large consortium of international partners. Uh, it's an initiative of the Urban Health Network for Latin America and the Caribbean, LAC Urban Health, that you are all welcome to look up and, and join if you're interested. Um, the project is funded through the Welcome Trust through the Welcome Trust Our Planet Our Health initiative. Uh, as I mentioned, it's a, a very uh, special and unique collaboration across the region. Um, we have partners in several uh, countries, uh, Argentina, Brazil, uh, Chile, Colombia, Mexico, Peru, eh, Guatemala, y otros países de Cent and other countries in Central America. And also we have a collaboration with the Pan American Health Organization, with the University of California at Berkeley and with Washington University in St. Louis. So it's a truly uh, unique um, network of researchers across the Latin American region. We have four objectives to Salurval. One is to analyze urban data to reveal how cities impact health outcomes, health inequities, and environmental sustainability. And we will, um, as part, we will hear about this today. Uh, both of our presentations focus uh, on this objective. We have compiled a very rich data set that we will tell you a little bit more about to help us do this in partnership with the whole region. The second objective is to evaluate the impact of urban policies and interventions on health and the environment. And we have a number of initiatives that are led by uh, colleagues in various countries that are doing this. The third uh, objective is to use systems approaches to gain insight into the dynamic relationships between urban environment health and environmental impact, impact. And we have done a number of workshops and also are doing some actual systems modeling for this aim. And last but not least, the fourth aim is to work with policymakers and the media to disseminate our research so that it, we can, it can be used to create change. And this webinar series is one of the things that we are doing to get uh, uh, the work out there and get input from the users of this knowledge on how we can make it more useful. So as I mentioned, Salurbal has compiled and, and harmonized data for 371 cities in are the countries that are part of the study. And you see there's a very large distribution in population sizes. It's cities of 100,000 people or more that we have identified using a variety of methods. Um, and there's a, you know, a large heterogeneity and differences across the cities, which is exactly what, what we're studying to understand why some cities might be healthier or have lower health inequalities than others and better environmental factors so that we can identify policy levers. And the uh, data that we have uh, encompasses uh, health, um, mortality and life expectancy, health risk factors, health related behaviors, violence. It also encompasses characteristics of the built and physical environments of cities listed here. Some examples are listed on the slide and also measures of the social environment and equity uh, related to poverty, income inequality, housing, education, employment. Today, we'll be hearing uh, a couple of presentations that focus on mortality and life expectancy. And we have this information for cities, but also for um, 
uh, subsidies, that is for smaller areas uh, within uh, the city as well, so that we can look at neighborhood differences in the next stage of the study. Uh, you'll see some of that um, today as well. And last but not least, um, after this introduction to Salurval, I'm going to introduce our two speakers. Each of them will speak for about 10, 10 minutes uh, or so. Um, and then we will have time for a discussion and questions from you. So we really look forward to your, to your questions and comments. So our two speakers are uh, Ana Ortigosa. Uh, uh, Ana is currently a postdoctoral fellow. Um, she is a pediatrician uh, here at the, at the Drexel School of Public Health Urban Health Collaborative. She is a pediatrician by training in Ar from Argentina and has a master's and also has a PhD in epidemiology. She will be speaking on inequalities in infant mortality in 286 cities in Latin America. And our second speaker is Usama Bilal. Usama is uh, an assistant professor of epidemiology and biostatistics also at the Urban Health Collaborative. He is also a physician uh, uh, originally from Spain and uh, also has a PhD in epidemiology. And he will be speaking on inequalities in adult mortality and life expectancy in 363 cities. So I will turn it over to uh, Ana Ortigosa for our first presentation. Can you hear me, right? Thank you, Anna, and thank you also to this amazing audience. I think we reached more than 100 participants today, and this is, this is really cool that we are having a lot of interest on this, this topic that is really relevant in the region. So uh, I'm going to present results uh, of two studies uh, we carry out looking at the relationship between urban environment and infant mortality in Latin American cities. And it's our hope that these results can contribute to the debate on what is needed to be done in the region to achieve by 2030 the sustainable development goals related to child health and equity. I think it's important to understand first what infant mortality represents for the society in general. Uh, because infant lives are so closely related to living conditions where children born and grow, infant wellness and survival depends on how we imagine and design social, political, and economic structures in our society. Technically speaking, infant mortality is defined as the number of deaths among live births during the first year of life. And in Latin America, most of the infant deaths are still related to uh, causes preventable through cost-effective interventions. And even when uh, in the region, there has been uh, successfully implemented many of these health interventions, uh, addressing further reductions may, may require to think about the role the urban environment has as a determinant of infant mortality in cities. This is particularly important in Latin America because the process of urbanization has been characterized by great heterogeneity, not only across countries, but also between cities in the same country. For example, on one side, we have uh, cities where urban growth have come with great economic development and also greater and better access to services, including healthcare. But on the other side, there are many cities where the lack of a systematic urban design have, have led to uh, a, a densely populated settings with increased social economic disparities and also uh, a great environmental pollution, which represents a vulnerable context for infants. In this webinar, we will show results for, uh, based on uh, 286 cities in eight Latin American countries. Uh, and uh, among the Salurbal project, this study on infant mortality is trying to understand the extent to which variation in infant mortality rates in cities can explain differences in country level infant mortality rates. Also, we which characteristics of the urban environment are linked to infant mortality rates in cities. And finally, what these results suggest us about local actions that are, are helping to reduce mortality, infant mortality in Latin America. 
So how infant mortality in cities can explain differences in infant mortality across countries can be visualized in the, these two graphs. On this side, uh, we show uh, the infant mortality rate trends at national levels for all the countries that we included in our study from 1955 to 2015. In this graph, we can see that most of the countries experience a great rate of reduction in their infant mortality levels through the second half of the past century. But once they reach some certain levels of infant mortality rates, even if they're still high, the rate of reduction tends to slow down. And if we can see in current years, the, it seems like across countries, the level of infant mortality are quite similar. But even when these, uh, these levels seems very, very close to each other uh, at the national level, we can see in the graph uh, picture on the, on, the, on the right that there is great variability when we look at the levels of infant mortality in cities. In this figure, we see that each dot is representing the level of infant mortality in cities, and the straight lines are, uh, are, are describing the mean infant mortality rate at the country level. We see that, excepting from Chile or Costa Rica, most of the straight lines are very similar and close to this red line, which is representing the infant mortality rate, the median infant mortality rate of our sample, which was ar around 11 deaths uh, per thousand life births. We see that the distribution of uh, infant mortality rates in cities is very dispersed even in the same country, like for example in Argentina or in Brazil or Colombia or Mexico, we see that there are uh, places where infant mortality can be as low as eight deaths per thousand life birth or as high as 18, 000, uh, 18 deaths per thousand life birth. We estimated that uh, almost 60% of the variability in infant mortality across countries is explained by differences in cities be between cities in the same country. Now, how, um, uh, uh, which aspects of uh, the urban environment are linked to infant mortality in cities? Uh, for, for trying to respond to these questions, uh, we, we gather uh, census demographic and socioeconomic indicators that help us to describe characteristics of urban poor and also other features of the city, such as population growth, uh, mass, uh, public transportation, and access to healthcare. Uh, we characterize the socioeconomic environment by creating three different socioeconomic scores that were uncorrelated among them, and they were trying to depict different aspects in relation to structural living conditions um, related to house, uh, housing, overcrowding, and also social exclusion, what kind of services are provided by the city, and also the level of educational atten attainment in overall adult population. We see, we found that one standard deviation higher population growth was associated with uh, our, around 5% lower infant mortality in cities. That also better uh, or higher uh, so housing and living conditions and service provision were independently associated uh, with 14 and 12% lower infant mortality rate. That the availability of uh, bus rapid, either bus rapid transit or subway was also linked with almost 10% lower infant mortality rate. We haven't found in our study uh, any association between population educational attainment and access to healthcare, represented by the first dose of uh, triple viral vaccine coverage. We further then wanted to uh, see how uh, or the role of women empowerment in cities uh, can explain differences in infant mortality rates across cities. In this case, in the same way as we did for the social economic scores, we also created uh, two women empowerment scores that were grouping um, indicators, soci socioeconomic indicators related to employment and education disaggregated by, by sex. In the first score, we see, we call it women's labor force participation, and we also are assuming uh, as a marker of differences between men and women, because it's including shared proportion of education and employment. In the second one, we use it, uh, we call it educational attainment among women, and we assume it as a differences among women 
because it's uh, trying to assess which uh, uh, proportion of women achieve certain level of education. In this case, we also found that one standard deviation higher women's labor force participation score were associated with a six, almost 6% 6 lower infant mortality rates in all of, of, of the countries we included. And only in countries with lower economic development, uh, educational attainment, higher educational attainment among women was associated with 4% lower infant mortality rate in cities. Finally, with these results, we would like to contribute to the discussion on how we revisit strategies oriented to prevent and reduce infant mortality in our region. The associations we showed between different aspects of the urban environment and infant mortality are emphasizing that the urban context need to be included as part of maternal and infant prevention, pro mortality prevention programs. This means that in addition of uh, granting access to prenatal care or skilled care or vaccine delivery, we also need to consider uh, women's uh, strategies that involve women's and girls' uh, involvement or development, and also physical environment improvement in, or interventions that uh, uh, address physical environment improvements. And perhaps these physical environment interventions are being are taking place in cities as part of the urban design or, or urban strategies design, but it's necessary that these, these uh, actions emphasize or prioritize, prioritize women and, and children as the main beneficiaries because they are representing the greatest proportion of urban poor in Latin American cities. We also, there are evidences that um, women with access to paid work are, are uh, key to reduce poverty and inequality in Latin America. And, and this is particularly true in Latin American cities where it is, there is an increasing proportion of women headed households. This is because on one hand, women with their own income are uh, making the decisions uh, of uh, household expenditure and also savings that are more related to child health and child wellness. And on the other side, because uh, economic participation of women and girl education is associated with a decreasing, trend, decreasing uh, natality and fertility rates, particularly among adolescents, which is also uh, associated with lower infant mortality. Finally, uh, we know that uh, housing in, uh, improvement are necessary because uh, overcrowding and uh, uh, poor housing condition, as well as poor access to sanitation, it's linked to higher prevalence of respiratory and enteric infections, which, remain, which remains as main causes of uh, infant and child death. And the role of transportation is less uh, explored, but it might be possible that uh, uh, facilitating access to um, public transportation, it's also granting uh, access to uh, healthcare services. So my take out notes or my last message is, is that in conclusion, we can, we can see that cities are vital to reduce uh, infant mortality rates in Latin America, that local strategies to prevent infant death need to be comprehensive and adequate services and ensuring women's social participations in cities is important uh, is an important part for, uh, for infant targeted health interventions. I will use my sli as, uh, last slide to announce that all these results will be uh, compiled in a data brief that is going to come soon in the next few months. And if you want to receive this, uh, this brief, uh, consider to sign up to our newsletter. I think it will appear in the chat box soon. And also once it is available, you can access and download it from our website. So um, thank you very much. And I will now turn it over to Sama, who is going to talk about inequalities in life expectancy and adult mortality.
We can't hear Usama for some reason. Sorry. Um, I think sorry. Now, start. yes. Go back. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, as I was saying, thank you, Anna. As I was saying, um, uh, I, I wanted to provide a summary of how uh, there are differences between life expectancy between Latin American cities, uh, how does this vary between and within countries, how does the, the mortality profiles, that is the specific causes of death, vary uh, between and, with, and within countries, and then show an, an example of variability in life expectancy within large uh, Latin American cities. Uh, so on the first aspect, on how does life expectancy vary across Latin American cities, uh, we calculated life expectancy at birth, uh, which is a measure of uh, if someone is born today and mortality patterns that are uh, that are current today, uh, if they if they hold, this is the average that someone will will be expected to live if those if those patterns don't change over time. We see it as a summary of the entire mortality experience of the entire population across ages, and it's it is an easy to communicate um, aspects since it's measuring years, which is uh, something that is uh, more straightforward to understand. So what we see here on this figure on the left will be life expectancies for each of 363 cities that we looked at in nine countries, in Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, Mexico, Panama, Peru, and El Salvador. Each of those dots is a city. On the left, we see the life expectancies for women in those cities. On the right, we see the life expectancies for, for, for men in those cities. Uh, there are some uh, key uh, differences here between, this, between and within these plots. Uh, first of all, as observed um, in many, many countries, and in case of in all of our cities, life expectancy is higher in the case of women as compared to men. The other aspect uh, we see here is that while there are some between country differences, and you can see them, for, the, for example, uh, in, in Chile, where you see that uh, cities tend to have a higher life expectancy. Most in the three cities we have in Panama, two of them have a higher life expectancy than most other cities. The single city we have in Costa Rica, San Jose, has a higher life expectancy than other cities. So we see that pattern where a few of the countries tend to have higher life expectancy. But we also see a pattern of very wide variability within the countries. So this is not only differences that uh, occur between countries, but also within countries. And we see that especially stark in the case of men. Where, where, where we see that the range of life expectancies in men is up to 10 years in the case of, uh, in the case of Mexico, comparing the city with the highest versus the city with the lowest life expectancy. And likewise, we see a similar pattern in Brazil and in, and in Colombia with very wide variability in life expectancy within the country. So the cities are very, very uh, different. Now, we wanted to put this in context, and the way we decided to put this in context is by comparing it to other countries. How do these cities compare to other countries? We selected a few countries that have a similar life expectancy to other high-income countries, that would be Germany as the example, countries that has a similar life expectancy to other middle-high-income countries, that would be Morocco, a country that has similar life expectancy to middle-income countries, Egypt, to low, um, to, to low middle income countries such as India, and then to low income countries such as Afghanistan. We added the USA there as a, as a comparison too. And our cities essentially stack like this. They are mostly in the case of women spanning life expectancies going from, from middle income countries to high income countries. We have a few cities, some of them located in Chile that have a life expectancy uh, that is almost that of Germany, and it's actually in most cases uh, higher than the life expectancy in the USA. On the other side, we have quite a few cities that have life expectancy that is similar to middle income countries. And keep in, count, keep in mind that most, uh, most countries in Latin America in our sample, with a few exceptions, are, uh, are uh, uh, middle high income uh, countries. Now, in the case of men, as we said before, there is a lot more variability, and that is reflected in the same plot where a few of our cities have actually lower life expectancies than, for example, India, which is a lower middle income country. And we see that some cities, in the case in these blue cities here, have very low levels of life expectancy. So again, very wide variability uh, within countries, not only, uh, not only between, between countries. Now, how is this, um, how is this, um, how is this heterogeneity express itself in spatial patterns? We can see that here. It's a map of 
of the uh, of the region with uh, with the area of of every city color uh, by life expectancy. On the left we see women, and on the right uh, we see men. Uh, red colors are lower levels of life expectancy. Green colors are higher levels of life expectancy with uh, with yellow being uh, middle levels of life expectancy. And we see several patterns here. First of all, for, for women, uh, we see that uh, Mexico tends to have lower levels of life expectancy overall, but we also see uh, wide differences within countries too. So for example, in the case of Brazil, we see that the North and the Northeast has lower levels of life expectancy than cities in the South, in the South and the Southeast. I would say, for example, in Peru, very wide differences between the between the between the the coast of Peru and then the especially the jungle region of Peru, with uh, much lower levels of life expectancy. The case of men, again, as we said before, a lot more variability here. And for example, in Mexico, which we we see cities with higher levels of life expectancy and cities with very low levels of life expectancy. For, for, for example, some of the cities we were seeing with lower levels of life expectancy in the previous plots in Mexico are located in the state of in the state of Guerrero, where we will see now that the patterns of of mortality there are heavily skewed towards violent deaths. In the case of Brazil, we see a similar pattern, and uh, even we see variability in countries with, that have narrower variability, such as Argentina, we still see a pattern with the North having lower levels of life expectancy compared to other regions of the, of the country. Now, this is overall levels of mortality. Here, we are looking at what are the causes of that. So the next result I want to highlight is how do the mortality profiles vary between Latin American cities? And what do we mean by these mortality profiles? Uh, so what we have done is take all of these deaths and classify them by the cause of death. Uh, we provide here an example of these five categorizations in a single city. In this case, that would be Mexico City, Ciudad de Mexico. Um, we classify all deaths in five categories. The first one is communicable maternal, neonatal, and nutritional causes. These are deaths such as deaths by influenza, deaths by diarrhea, deaths by dengue. COVID deaths would be classified here, for, for example. Then we have deaths by cancer, including lung and breast cancer, deaths by cardiovascular and other non-communicable diseases. This includes car car cardiovascular, such as stroke and heart attacks, but also liver disease and diabetes. We have an intentional injuries, which a good number of them are traffic crashes, but there's also drug overdoses, falls, etc. And last, violent or intentional injuries, which includes uh, homicides and suicides. So in the case of Mexico City, we find that uh, for every 100 deaths, so I mean, there's 100 people that died last year, for example, uh, nine of those will have died of uh, communicable maternal, neonatal, or nutritional death. 14 of those died because of a cancer death, 68 died because of cardiovascular or other non-communicable diseases, which is the most common cause of death in the region. Five died because of unintentional injuries and five died because of violent injuries. Now, just to compare it with a couple more cities with a very different pattern, uh, let's compare that with Jujuy in, in Argentina that has a lot more deaths due to uh, communicable maternal, neonatal, or nutritional deaths. For example, in the case of, in the case of, of Jujuy, of 100 deaths, 23 of them are due to communicable maternal, neonatal, or nutritional deaths. Now, another very different place is Acapulco in, in Mexico, where we find that for every 100 deaths, 20 of them are due to violent injuries, most of those being uh, homicides. So as you can see, three examples of different cities uh, two of them in Mexico, one of them in Argentina, with very different mortality uh, profiles. Now, if we put together the 363 cities, how does this look like? Well, what we have done here is essentially compile data from the 363 cities, the same ones we looked in life expectancy, and we and we for each one of them we plotted how many deaths were due to communicable maternal, neonatal, and nutritional on blue on top, how many deaths were due to cancer on red. How many deaths are due to cardiovascular and other NCDs? So this big chunk here on, um, on, uh, on yellow. How many deaths are due to unintentional injuries? Most of the traffic crashes in purple. And then last in teal uh, or green-ish, uh, how many deaths are due to violent injuries? In most cities, mostly uh, homicides. So uh, we sorted them in this case by the proportion of deaths that are due to violent injuries. And we found enormous variability here. There are cities with roughly very, very few deaths due to violent injuries, and cities such as Acapulco, as an example, 
with very, very high levels, including 20% of all deaths. So one in five deaths are due to violent injuries in some cities of Latin America. In some cities, very, very few deaths are due to violent injuries. So very, very uh, wide variability. And even within the same country, in countries like Mexico or Brazil, there's very, very wide variability. Now here we've done the same thing, but we sorted it by unintentional injuries finding that here on the left, some cities have only 3% of deaths due to unintentional injuries, and on the right here, some cities have up to 19%, so almost one in every five deaths due to unintentional injuries, mostly at traffic crashes. In the case of communicable maternal, neonatal, and nutritional conditions, we found a lot of variability here, uh, going from 6 to 55%. In the case of this type of deaths, we don't show that data here, but a lot of them, a lot of the cities with very high proportion are located in Peru, where there are much higher levels of communicable maternal, neonatal, and nutritional deaths, and cities with very, very high levels, more than 40% of deaths. The case of cancer, uh, a little bit less variability, but still quite a lot, going from 10 to 30%. And as in the case of communicable deaths, there is also uh, some country clustering here, and a lot of the deaths, a lot of the cities with high proportion of deaths are located in Chile, for example. And last, in the case of non-communicable diseases and cardiovascular diseases, again, the most common cause of death uh, in most cities uh, and the most common cause of death overall in the region, we found that this varies from 28 to 71 percent. So um, there are quite a few cities where definitely most deaths are due to uh, non-communicable diseases and, and cardiovascular diseases, a lot of them located in Mexico with very high levels of this type of, of diseases. So that's for an overall picture of uh, between 363 cities in nine countries in Latin America. Now I want to highlight uh, results from a publication we did last year on looking at six, focusing on six large cities and how life expectancy varies uh, within them. So what we did here is we calculated life expectancy for men and women in six cities, in Belo Horizonte, Buenos Aires, Mexico City, Panama City, San Jose de Costa Rica, and Santiago de Chile. We calculated that and we saw how levels of education in the, in the areas where those people were living correlated with levels of life expectancy. And I just wanted to, to provide a brief summary here in the case, for example, of women. Uh, what we see here, here on, this, on this figure is every city with, with its areas, so for example, comunas and partidos in Buenos Aires, municipios of Belo Horizonte, delegaciones and municipios of Mexico City, etc. And the uh, areas that are more to the right of this plot have higher levels of education, areas that are higher on this plot have higher levels of life expectancy. So what we see for all of these cities is that areas that have higher levels of education tend to have much higher life expectancy. This is especially stark in the case of Santiago de Chile and Panama, where there are wide disparities in, in life expectancy. Now, we also map this, and for example, in the case of Santiago, and this is for both a men and women pooled, uh, we found a very uh, stark uh, spatial pattern, and a spatial pattern that we can actually see with many, many indicators in the case of Santiago de Chile, where we see areas of higher life expectancy in the northeastern area of the city, all of the Barrio Alto and all of the wealthiest area of the city. When we published this, it was at the same time that, uh, that uh, Chile was undergoing quite a few protests about social in inequality, and our results confirm some of these ideas of wide levels of social inequality in Chile. And actually, this research was, was featured in some of the um, in some of the media in the region highlighting these very, very wide in inequalities in some of the cities, including Santiago de Chile and Buenos Aires. So uh, in conclusion, uh, mortality varies widely across Latin American cities in the Salurbal uh, study. Specifically, highly life expectancy is highly variable with cities ranging from values that are similar to low to lower middle income countries and cities that have life, levels of life expectancy similar to high income countries. Also causes of death vary widely, especially violent and unintentional injuries that are very, very, uh, they, they range a lot even within the same country. Uh, and last, life expectancy is highly unequal within six uh, large Latin American cities. We hope to be able to extend this to other Latin American cities, large and small, in the future, and that will be part of the work we will be doing in the following years in the in the Salurbal in the Salurbal study. Um, 
that's all in the case of, of adult mortality and life expectancy. And now we would like to open it up for 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 questions. Thank you for your for your attendance. Thank you very much, uh, Anna and Usama, for those very clear uh, presentations. Um, uh, just a reminder to our audience, in case you joined us l later, this is the first in a series of webinars that Salurba will be hosting to share some of our findings. Um, you uh, can uh, ask questions in through the chat function, and we will try to get through as many as we can. And at the end, we'll also share additional information on how you can learn more about Saluval and the Urban Health Network for Latin America and the Caribbean. So uh, we have a number of questions here. I'm going to uh, uh, share, start to share a, a few of them. Um, one important question asks about how Salurbal will assess the impact of racial inequity on mortality and if we have plans to do that. And the, the writer says, um, we are uh, beginning to document more and more that systematic and individual racism are drivers of almost all disparities in this country. And we know that Latin America is not immune to rampant racism. So how do we take the lessons we're learning in this country and help us understand mortality disparities in Latin America. I don't know if Usama or Anna wants to comment on 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 that topic. So, so I I just want to provide a very brief comment. We are doing some research on this, specifically looking at segregation and how uh, racial segregation and other types of segregation too have an effect on mortality and, and on other aspects. But one thing I wanted to highlight: this is not research I am conducting, but that the importance of having good data and the importance of having data that actually collects uh, comparable um, data in terms of, of, of race and ethnicity and how very, very few countries of Latin America are systematically collecting data on, on, on race and uh, a little bit more are, connecting, are collecting data on in the case of ethnicity. So that's very, very important. And that's a very strong limitation analysis of, of this. Brazil has a very, very long history of, of collecting good data on on race, but some of the other countries have much more limited data. So this is definitely something that we are working on, but this is something that we need to push and we need to continue asking censuses and mortality data, vital registration data, et cetera, et cetera, to keep collecting good data on, on this. Because with, without good data, it's very, very hard to, to conduct this kind of research. Mm -hmm. One thing I would just uh, adding to that, uh, which uh, is that um, because there is a uh, race data collected in Brazil, we do have some team members who are very interested in comparing uh, racial differences, for example, in the US and in Brazil and, and, uh, and, and trying to understand what differences and similarities are. Sherelle Barber, for example, is one of our team members, a faculty member here with us who uh, is, has been working on, on this topic, looking at uh, racial segregation, discrimination, racism in the context of Brazil compared, for example, to the United States. And as Busama said, uh, a big challenge is the, the paucity of racial or ethnic data in many of the other countries. And we know this is a big, big problem. Um, but we're, we're hoping that, you know, one of the things that Salurval is making clear is when, you know, when data is missing. <laughs> and so making that visible is a, a very important aspect of the study as well. Um, uh, so an, another uh, uh, another question. Um, uh, let's see here. We uh, have many questions. Uh, one question uh, mentions that you know we we these uh, although this is the first time that this kind of data has been harmonized and compiled. Um, uh, it's not necessarily knew that we see these inequities in mortality, in, in, in infant mortality and in adult mortality. What, what is Salurval uh, doing uh, to try to promote actions or policies to address these inequities? I can take the first part at least for infant mortality. I think, uh, well, so this, this is, uh, I, I, I mentioned these are two uh, studies we we have, but in terms of uh, child health, we, we have a, a, a working group among the project that is trying to see particularly, putting particularly focused on maternal and child outcomes. 
And um, the idea is, well, with, with this data that we have, trying to reach local levels, because I think this is important to put in the agenda of, of, uh, of local stakeholders to, to take actions for prevention uh, in infant mortality. And I think the, the, the things we mentioned are pretty known or, or are things that maybe cities are doing, but I think the, the way they are channelized, I, I think that's something we need to emphasize. So I think reaching local levels is strategic so to, to reinforce uh, maternal and infant prevention programs. Uh, Usama, did you want to add anything or? Uh, well, more, mostly what Anna said, and also that I think it's very important that we put this data out in terms of, um, you know, uh, providing people with the tools to ask their governments for, to, to pressure their governments to tackle social inequality, because this is not only something that affects uh, how much they earn, what are their living conditions, but down the line is essentially causing a huge gap in longevity saying that the people living in wealthier areas will live way longer than the people living in poorer areas. So that's one of the most basic in inequalities that will exist. Putting it out, I, I hope, helps people in asking governments for uh, social inequality policies. I also wanted to add that this is, uh, so what we've shown about the, the futures, urban futures influencing infant mortality, it's what we were able to gather uh, from very large uh, data, uh, probably um, census, so mostly it's census data, but there are many other aspects of uh, poverty related to children that needs to be collected and needs to be uh, prioritized as data. And these are multidimensional ways of how we consider poverty among children that cities are key to, to monitor and also to, to collect this data. So I think uh, the two ways we, we see this information can can be uh, translated into actions is once to take actions on uh, policies for reducing mortality, but also to discuss how much more and better we can we can uh, describe this this uh, phenomenon of mortality in cities to co by collecting better data for children. Right. One of the, as I mentioned earlier, Salurval is unique, I think, among big research studies in that it has a whole aim, which is about policy, policy translation. And so um, we, uh, we are working with a number of stakeholders across the region to try to get the information out and to discuss the implications of the information, of course, uh, for, for urban policies in, in the region. Uh, we have uh, another question. Um, asking about, uh, for Usama, about the, the quality of the mortality data and a related issue. There was another question about um, garbage codes and, 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 and issues related to coding of, of causes. If you could comment a little bit on the, all the work that has gone into the quality assessment of the data. And yes, that's, 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 that, that's a lot of work and it's actually something that it's 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 tricky to um to summarize in, in in three hours of of a lecture but the key thing here is that we need to consider several sources of issues with uh, quality one of them is that in some of our countries there is um there is a proportion of all deaths that don't end up in a vital registration system uh, that lack of complete coverage is 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 an issue and it's an issue specifically in countries such as peru Peru has a big problem with, with that. And then there is also some issues in Central American countries and in, and in Colombia. So some deaths occur, never end up in a vital registration system. Now, the key thing to understand here is that these things don't occur randomly. It's not that every death, someone flips a coin and decides to include it or not. These things are socially patterned. So if we don't correct for this kind of, 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 of biases, we are going to be hiding a lot of uh, social inequality that underlies vital registration itself. So we have done a big effort of trying to correct this at the, uh, at the city level, applying some of the most commonly used um, demographic methods and the results you have seen are already uh, corrected for that. Same thing applies with the coding of causes of death. Do, whether a death ends up being a violent injury or a cardiovascular death, etc. That is something that definitely uh, when when things are what we call a garbage code or an ill-defined death, which is a death that has essentially a cause of death that is not interpretable, 
uh, it's very hard to say what, what caused that death, right? So that's, again, not random. It, it doesn't occur randomly. And we have applied some common demographic methods to, to, to try to correct that. Now, what I've presented today is a very brief, uh, sorry, a very um, macro level overview. We have people working on specific causes of death, trying to get the best possible data in terms of uh, injury data, in terms of violent injury data, trying to, to, to combine different data sources and trying to bring in more information to get uh, very precise estimates on, for example, the number of deaths that are due to road traffic uh, crashes, the number of deaths that are due to suicides or to homicides, et cetera. So that's something we are we are we are working on, and we acknowledge that that's something that we continue improving. But we need, we think that having very high quality data in this sense is key, especially to to uncover social uh, in inequality. Thank you, um, Anna. There's a, another question for you. If you could comment a little bit on how you measured access to healthcare and, and, and what some of the challenges there might be. Yeah, so access to health as a, a kind of indicator is complicated because it, it could mean many different things. So, so far what we were able to retrieve across all countries and that could be easily harmonizable was uh, vaccine coverage. But we know that vaccine coverage is not enough to uh, depict access to healthcare, particularly in children. Um, what, we, what we are trying to do as an effort uh, in, among the project is trying to retrieve other indicators that are more sensitive of how um, or, or whether a person is available to reach um, services when they are in an emergency or they are needing uh, of a treatment or uh, they are in need of a treatment. But yeah, so as a, as, as a third attempt, we just uh, used the first dose of triple viral vaccine coverage as uh, a proxy of access to healthcare. Just because that variable, it's quite homogeneous. So that the, the first dose, it's, uh, it's administered in the same way across all countries. It's at, uh, at the end of the first year or around the first year of life. So that was uh, a simpler, and I think it's a very rudimentary, but also very, very important uh, marker of uh, access to healthcare, or minimum, minimum um, characteristics of access to health. So the study as a whole also is, has a whole working group that's looking at other approaches to characterize access to healthcare, as Anna was saying. So. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, we know that it's an important domain to measure, but it's a quite, quite complicated to get uh, good data uh, that's uh, systematic and comparable across cities. But we're, we're, we have a team who's, that also is exploring other options as well. Um, there were, uh, there's a, another question uh, commenting on this issue of, that both of you noted of this variability um, you know, across countries and cities, the issue that, um, that uh, although there are clearly differences across countries in uh, life expectancy overall or infant mortality overall, what you both found was uh, also evidence that there's a lot of variation between cities within each country. Um, and if you could, you know, comment, could you comment on what that, you know, what the implications of that might be or uh, whether you found that surprising or not or what, you know. Sorry, and I lost you in a minute. So could you repeat the, the question? If you could comment on the finding of uh, significant variability within countries, across cities within a country. Uh, uh, even though you see some overall country differences, there's a lot of variability within countries across cities. Both of you found that. And I, if you could just comment on the implications of that or any reflections on that topic. Yeah, so uh, in, in my case, in the case of life expectancy, I think the variability we are, we, we are seeing matches very well the variability we are seeing in causes of death. So for example, the fact that uh, violent injuries which predominantly kill uh, younger people than other causes. And in this case, tend to disproportionately affect uh, mostly uh, men in the case of, 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 of fatal uh, violent injuries. Uh, the fact that we find that that thing varies a lot within country matches very well the variability we see within country life expectancy. So some of the cities with the lowest levels of life expectancy we have found specifically in the case of, 
of men are in areas with very, very high levels of violence. So Acapulco and, and Iguala in the case of Mexico, where around 15 to 20 percent of deaths are due to violence, have the lowest levels of life expectancy in those areas. And that's what I think drives a lot of this difference between the results we find in men and the results we find in women, where in men we find a lot of uh, within country variability. In the case of women, we find a little bit less of within country uh, vari variability. So I think violent injuries in the case of life expectancy are driving a lot of those uh, a lot of those differences. Now, in the case of of women, I think a lot of the deaths that we will explore in the future, but that I think are interesting to to consider, relate to to maternal mortality which is included in that category of communicable maternal, neonatal, and nutritional deaths. Uh, and that's something definitely that, while it varies within country, it varies a lot more between countries. So I think that's why we see a little bit less of within country variability in the case of, of, of women. But we saw that pattern, for example, in Peru, where the area of the jungle had a much lower life expectancy. And, and that's an area with much higher maternal mortality and infectious disease mortality. So that, that's definitely consistent with that pattern. And I, and I want to say, and I want to highlight that uh, those differences between men and women, while we are showing them here, they are also differences that, that are observed in the case of life expectancy in many countries in, in, the, in the world. And that we are, in, in the case of what I showed, we are looking at life expectancy. So we are looking at mortality. Now, I think it will be very in, in, interesting to try to understand whether that life expectancy is healthy. And I think we have seen from research conducted in other areas, specifically in Europe, that while women have longer life expectancy, they do have, uh, they tend to have shorter healthy life expectancy and levels of morbidity tend to be much higher in women as compared to men. So what we are showing here again is mortality. It's not whether that life is lived with high levels of well-being or anything else, just uh, pure uh, years of life. Of, of life. Uh, we need to conduct better research to, uh, to understand whether those differences in mortality are translated into differences in well-being and levels of overall health. Following up on that, there was another question about gender differences. Uh, acknowledging that gender differences in adult mortality is not unique to Latin American cities, I'm curious to know if there's a, a theoretical premise that provides insight into why women who are presumably experiencing greater marginalization have longer life expectancy. Uh, I don't know if any of you want to comment on that or perhaps also elaborate a little bit on the initiatives in Salud Val looking at uh, gender uh, issues, perhaps? All right, uh, yeah, so I wanted just to add it to the previous question that I think for infant mortality, the main thing that we, we see some the greater variability within countries, it's, it's key to, uh, to this, remark the, the role that cities will have for reducing infant mortality. And I think that's strategic to creating uh, local actions and maybe local actions may differ city by city. But so far, most of the countries have implemented national programs and they were, although they were uh, enforced differently or uh, translated differently in each, in each city, they may have a, a framework that it's quite homogeneous across countries. And we need to start to think about how we, we create uh, targeted uh, programs by cities but because while we saw the influence of the urban environment related to infant mortality it's things that we already knew I mean I'm a pediatrician I know that if you don't have water drinking water you can have enteric, um, enteric diseases so this is something that everyone's know in the community but how we are doing things to prevent that it's I think it's a unique lesson from from this uh, this kind of studies and on the other side, regarding what we are doing about uh, uh, trying to explore differences uh, in gender gap mortality, uh, yes, we are uh, trying, uh, this is one of the further projects we have at the Salvo uh, study that is uh, creating a women empowerment score measure that can um, describe empowerment of women in cities and try to see differences because it's a postulate that women's empowerment, it's not beneficial only for women, but also to uh, population health in general. But we have seen in other developed countries that uh, perhaps, you know, encouraging women to the development, it's, it's something that uh, it can be in detriment 
for the health, as Osama was saying, it, maybe it's a longer uh, life, but it's not as healthy or, or wealthy as uh, it could be. And this might be key to think about what are the policies that we are developing at the country level, particularly uh, in terms of protecting the, this, this development in women. In, in the sense that uh, if we encourage women to participate in the labor force, but we are not addressing the division of the domestic labor, for example, or we are not granting uh, division of uh, the care of the children or other members of the family, we are putting a double burden on, on, on women, like working out the house and also we, uh, keeping working in houses. So. Thank you. Um, you know, this is another aspect of Salorval also to look at the differences and how they vary across cities. So, for example, how do gender differences vary across cities? Uh, even, even if more women tend to have longer life expectancy for a number of reasons than men, is that the same across all cities? Perhaps not. And if not, what, what are the factors that are responsible for that? Um, so that's what some of the, the data platform that we're creating will allow us uh, to look at. Um, there was a, another uh, technical, bit of a technical question for uh, Usama. Uh, do you have uh, mortality profiles based on rates or probability of dying rather than proportional mortality? Uh, yes. Uh, now we are using proportional mor mortality for two reasons. One of them is that, you know, to just provide an overview of mortality profiles, we believe it's easier to understand for every hundred people this number died of this, this number died of that. Uh, the other reason is the issue with data quality. So uh, if we see that there are areas where not all deaths are being counted, while we correct for, for that, uh, we, we do think that proportionate more mortality is a more robust way of showing cause of death in the presence of lack of complete coverage. Now, we do have both, and we are actually using rates in many of our studies, not in the one I presented today, but in many of our studies, we are using our rates. So yeah, thank you for that question. That's very, very important. So I think we are at the end of our time. Um, I know that there were a lot more questions, but uh, there will be more opportunities. Uh, and uh, and we, we also encourage you to, uh, as you can see on your screen, to subscribe to our newsletter um, or, or uh, follow us on Twitter, etc. cetera. Uh, you can also look up our Salurbal uh, website, at which you will find through the lacurbanhealth.org uh, to learn more about the work that's going on. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you at a future uh, webinar or at some other uh, Salurbal activities. And thank you very much to Anna and Usama for such great presentations and excellent work. Thank you very much. Hasta, hasta, hasta pronto uh, y buenas tardes a todos. Gracias, hasta luego. Thank you, gracias.